<laughs> yeah, okay. All right, um, welcome everyone uh, to the fourth GSAP Lectures and Planning series of the semester. Um, today we have the pleasure of welcoming Jen Nelt, a researcher, professor, and consultant specializing um, in the area of metropolitan governance and regional economic development. Um, Professor Nels is particularly interested in developing ways of improving coordination between local authorities to address uh, mo modern social, economic, and environmental issues um, that inevitably transcend geographical and jurisdictional boundaries. Um, she's the author of Comparative Metropolitan Policy, Governing Beyond Local Boundaries in the Imagined Metropolis, um, co-author of A Quiet Evolution, The Emergence of Indigenous Local Intergovernmental Partnerships in Canada, and Discovering American Regionalism, <laughs> and so an introduction to regional <laughs> intergovernmental <laughs> organization. Um, she's currently an adjunct professor in urban policy and planning um, at Hunter College. Um, and uh, today's lecture will summarize some of the data in her latest book, uh, Discovering American Regionalism, and present a new way to conceptualize um, regional intergovernmental organizations and the role they play in regional policy coordination. Um, after the lecture, we'll open the floor for questions. Um, and with this, please uh, join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you. Can you guys hear me if I'm here? Like, I like to wander around a little bit. So if you can't, just yell at me, and I will move over here. All right. Um, thanks for coming today. It's cool to be back here. I was at the Lips. Lips? Just Lips? Just lips. Uh, <laughs> I want to say like four years ago, talking about something else, but also regional related. So I guess probably none of you were here for that, but um, here we go. We're going to do it again with a new twist. Um, so today I'm going to talk about regionalism in America, unpacking a deep tradition of governance. And at this point, usually I get a lot of like blank stares, maybe some giggles, uh, sometimes an eye roll or two because people that I you know, present this stuff to generally don't get regionalism. They're not super into it. They're like, eh, who cares? And it's not, you know, it's not really your fault if you're having that reaction. Um, regionalism kind of gets short shrift, right? It gets sort of an afterthought in a lot of our programs and education. Um, so I can't, I can't speak to uh, the curriculum up here, which I'm sure is much more thorough than everywhere else I've been. Um, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, much more thorough. Uh, but almost everywhere else I've taught and kind of interacted with in political science programs, planning programs, geography, regions are a little bit of an afterthought. Um, and here what I'm talking about when I talk about regions, I'm thinking about this from a more political science perspective in the sense of agglomerations of jurisdictions. Um, so this would be a multi-jurisdictional agglomeration of some sort. Usually we're talking about metropolitan regions. Um, today, and usually I only really care about metropolitan regions, but as you'll see later, uh, as we go through this, uh, the regions that I'm gonna talk about will also include some non-metropolitan regions as well. Anyway, so regions are a bit of an afterthought. Um, and uh, you know, even at Hunter College, which I think is a great place to be, uh, there's only one course that's a core course, thankfully, uh, that I teach most of the time. Um, that even discusses regions at all. Um, and otherwise, it's just sort of like a, maybe a unit that you get in a planning course um, or something that kind of comes up every now and again. And then when, when it does come up, often we're told that it's actually not really happening or important in America, right? We, you know, you get the, the old standards get trotted out. The Met Councils in... Portland, Oregon, and in Minneapolis, St. Paul are kind of thrown out there. If you're lucky, you get a little bit of two-tiered government um, in the form of Metro Toronto, which actually is where I'm from. Um, you know, that was a, that was a two-tier system that was much in vogue in, in planning and geography and political science circles for a while. Uh, like, started in the 50s, ended in the late 90s. We still talk about it for some reason. Um, anyway, so, so those, those are trotted out as sort of the things that, you know, are regionalism, regional governments, and those matter, but everything else is sort of like not that important. Um, and I'm here today to, to challenge that, to tell you, first of all, it is important. Secondly, it is happening in America. There's tons of regional activity occurring um, and regional governance across jurisdictional boundaries. Um, and not only that, like, mind blown, 
it's a deep tradition. This is not something that is brand new that I'm gonna like throw in front of you and be like, yesterday we started doing this. No, it goes way back um, and I'll show you, I'll show you that. Um, so get ready, mind blown. Okay, so since I have no idea what the baseline is here on caring about regions or knowing about them, I uh, thought of maybe a quick refresher on why we like to think about coordinating policies, particularly in activities across regional boundaries, matters. Um, this is the uh, New York Metropolitan, uh, uh, sorry, um, Metropolitan Statistical Area, uh, which is, if you, you probably have a pretty good sense of geography, it's pretty big. It's a pretty big thing. There are um, 26 counties and you know, 20, over 20 million people live in this jurisdiction, and that's complicated. Um, we need to think a little bit about cross-jurisdictional boundaries here, and there's a whole bunch of reasons to do that. So one of them is that while we tend to think about local governments as fairly autonomous, like they're, you know, we've got this American tradition of, of local autonomy being very strong, both in principle and, you know, ideologically. Um, but you know, think about it, local governments are like, really far down the pecking order. They're right at the bottom of the government hierarchy. And so no matter how autonomous they are in their own little worlds, they are constrained by the actions of others. So obviously state and federal policy act as constraints on what local governments can practically accomplish, uh, even within their boundaries of local autonomy. Um, so if you think about that, that's sort of a vertical constraint. Uh, but there are horizontal constraints as well, right? Local authorities, local governments are constrained by the decisions of their neighbors. You know, just like we are constrained by the decisions of our neighbors. If your neighbor decides to have a super loud party, hmm, you're dealing with that. Doesn't matter if there's a wall, doesn't matter, right? Um, so here's a, a non-exhaustive list about why we care about the, what's going on with our neighbors and why we might wanna get together with them occasionally Think about uh, coordinating policy and making policy at a regional scale. So one is, I've already mentioned externalities, right? Your, your noisy neighbors having a loud party, that affects you no matter how quiet you're being. <laughs> no matter how quiet you make your kids and pets be. If your neighbor is not, then you're dealing with it, right? I mean, the actual urban planning kind of analogy of that is, you know, you can plan a park space, a beautiful park, on the boundaries of your municipality and populate it with butterflies and animals, and your neighbor puts a huge sticky factory right next to that, you can't do anything about it. There's, you know, that's their, it's their land use plan, not yours. Um, so you, those are externalities that you have to deal with. So like at that point, you know, you probably, well before that point, you probably wanna to talk to your neighbor. And like maybe just harmonize what you're doing on the boundaries there so that you're not uh, stepping on each other's toes. So externalities, and that's just like a, a trivial example. Um, economies of scale you're probably familiar with, right? <clears throat> Sometimes you're too small to be able to provide a service. Snow removal, fire protection, uh, water systems, power systems, for instance, right? So you get together with your neighbors until there are enough of you that you can afford it. Um, and so those, are, those create economies of scale. Um, mandates. Sometimes the federal or state government makes you cooperate with your neighbor because they want you to for a variety of reasons. Um, metropolitan planning organizations are mandated by the federal government in order to access transportation funding for every urban area, over 50,000 people. Um, so if you want any transportation funding money, you need to create a metropolitan planning organization and that is a form of regional governance. Um, competitiveness is something that comes up occasionally as well, right? When you're trying to attract investment, um, if you're a smaller place or if you're, even if you're a central city, sometimes it's useful to point to all of the beautiful amenities of your region um, in order to attract that investment because you're not gonna put an auto plant in the middle of downtown. You're gonna put it somewhere else uh, that's going to draw on the logistics infrastructure of an entire region. Um, a really good example of this is the HQ2 beauty contest. Some places, <laughs> some places uh, put in bids that were regional. 
So they got together with their neighbor to do that. And that was, that's kind of an interesting example of that in practice. Some places did not. New York is one of those places that did not. We'll see. New York doesn't play as well as others. Um, finally, and this is not final because there's a lot, I could go on all day, but spatial equity is an issue too. Um, a lot of times central cities are responsible for uh, providing all sorts of things like infra uh, infrastructure or uh, cultural amenities is another good example. And they kind of disproportionately bear the brunt of that. And so sometimes it's nice to, since that is a kind of regional amenity, uh, get together and try and fund those things collectively. Uh, so that's, that's one example of that, um, and I could, I could go on, I will not bore you with these. But as you can see, there are a whole bunch of reasons why one would want to coordinate across uh, jurisdictional boundaries. And because of that, we've been thinking about how to do it for kind of a long time. And we've come up with a lot of fun ways to do it. Um, I will not go through these in exhaustive detail, but just to like hit the high points. First, just like to note this, uh, government to governance. So this is sort of one way I like to think about the way I've organized these. Um, the ones at the top that are closer to the top are close to use it, closer to using um, solutions that look like governments, right? They're uh, hierarchical, they're top down, they have specific mandates. Um, usually they have tax raising authority or some sort of power to compel so that in within those regional arrangements, the members of it must comply with, for whatever reason. Closer to the bottom, we're talking governance. These are horizontally negotiated network type things um, based on cooperation, usually voluntary. Um, and there is no power to compel here, no formal power um, institutionalized here. It's all kind of persuasion to try and get to work together regionally. So starting at the top, easy, one super easy way to do this is if you can find out that you've got something that crosses jurisdictional boundaries and you're like, hey, how do we deal with it? Sometimes we just kick it up to the state level. I say state and provincial because, again, I come from Canada. Where in, you know, in Canada, we're a lot more aggressive about the provinces swooping in and just being like, you know what, you guys are not handling this. We're just going to take over. Uh, so that happens uh, a bunch. Uh, another way is to harmonize the functional boundaries and the political boundaries. So like if you have a, uh, like a situation where you've got externalities or you need economies of scale of some sort um, and your, your political boundaries aren't working out, you can harmonize those in a variety of ways. One is annexation. You can, a city can grow okay, by taking over control of its neighbors. Um, amalgamation is another one where Everybody is sort of combined into one big authority. Tr Metropolitan Toronto, which was a two-tier system that I mentioned, became amalgamated in 1998. So all of the sort of internal jurisdictional boundaries disappear. It's all one thing. Um, that's amalgamation. Um, and consolidation is another one, which is a word that sounds a lot like amalgamation. And honestly, uh, I use them differently. But that's when uh, it's sort of a similar idea. but. We get it here in the United States with city and county consolidation, where the city that is nested within the county spatially just becomes the county. So those boundaries just become the same. So the county stops existing, and the city becomes that big space. Um, and it's, they're governed as one thing. Um, so that's, those, that's a, government, a very government solution to this. Uh, you can add another layer of government. That's fun, right? Because <laughs> What the heck? Like, it's kind of hard to abolish governments. Nobody really wants to be rolled into another thing. So it's a little bit easier sometimes to just plop another layer on top. Um, and you know, I'll get into a bit of trouble by saying this, but like the Met Councils are, are kind of a good example of, are an example from one perspective of that, where the local government still exists. And they just like plopped, plopped a metropolitan level on top of that. Um, so that's a two-tier arrangement. Um, there are also special purpose districts, which are another way of kind of just adding another layer of government. Here it's, it's you know, a school district or a water district or a power district or a whatever. Um, that's usually a single purpose uh, organization um, that, that has a geography that's useful for that, for that purpose. Um, so that's adding another layer of government. <clears throat> and that's sort of the end of the like seriously government solutions. Um, 
And we start to get into the more governance territory. Uh, you can create regional intergovernmental organizations, which, spoiler alert, is what the rest of this is going to be about. But uh, just to like, for the purpose of this list, um, basically what these are voluntary, I'm going to put this on quotation marks because there's like some caveats to that, voluntary uh, arrangements of local governments that come together into things that, you know, you may have heard of councils of governments or regional planning commissions uh, or economic development districts. Uh, so they come together for various reasons. Usually these intergovernmental organizations are fairly permanent. They've existed for a while. Um, and <clears throat> they deal with multiple issues. So that, that distinguishes them from special purpose districts. And they don't really have formal powers, right? They have, rarely have any taxing powers. They don't really have any uh, powers to make their members do anything. Um, and so that's what we're gonna talk about today. But just quickly, the last three here, uh, establishing interlocal agreements. That's another thing you probably have come across more. We talk about this a lot in planning. Our interlocal agreements, these are usually service agreements. Um, where one party will contract with another or a group of parties will contract with, with one another to provide a service. So this will be, again, we're in the like trash collection, fire protection, kind of water provision racket here. Um, lots and lots written on that uh, and, and it's a really rich literature. Uh, informal cooperation, you could just you know, pick up the phone. <laughs> Ring, ring, like say, you don't really need a formal name or a, an acronym or an organization to do it. Just sort of have these conventions where you talk to your neighbors about, about various things. Uh, so those are, those are things. And then you can rely on civic organizations for leadership. Um, Regional Plan Association here in New York is a good example. This is not driven by government. It's driven by the private sector. Um, and... Those are advocacy organizations very interested in governing across jurisdictional boundaries, very interested in getting things ha happening, but that are not themselves governments. Um, so as I mentioned, we're, we're going to focus on creating regional intergovernmental organizations. And I have actually, there's a lot going on on this slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have pointed out that people don't feel awesome about regional uh, governance organizations or regional intergovernmental organizations uh, in general. Um, here's some quotes from Hamilton's book in 2014. Uh, he doesn't pull very many punches. He says they're created to give the illusion that something is being done. Um, they fail to develop strong political support. So basically they don't matter and they only have a real sort of weak sense of region for planning purposes. There are all sorts of other things that people will level against these regional intergovernmental organizations. Usually things related to um, the fact that they don't have formal powers. So like, how can they get anything done? Seriously. Um, usually they have very li limited revenue streams as well. Um, and there's also, uh, and I'll get to this in a little bit, um, uh, a whole line of, of critique about how decision making is very skewed within these organizations. Because if you think of like a traditional monocentric city region or metropolitan region, you have like a big, huge behemoth like New York City or Boston or Chicago, and then like a bunch of suburbs around it. Their suburbs kind of, you know, they outnumber the city. And so there's this real perception that like, how on earth could anything like, really effective would be happening there when uh, the city is so overwhelmed and outnumbered and like it's just not gonna get anything done. Um, yeah, so, so that's, that's a thing that I'm concerned about. Uh, <laughs> I work with uh, uh, my colleague David Miller who is at the University of Pittsburgh and we've been tackling uh, this, this question of sort of, you know, what's up with regional governance organizations? Are they like really, really that bad? Like, that just doesn't seem right to us. There, you know, there gotta be hundreds out there. Like, what, are they all bad? The literature would have you believe that, you know, pretty much, yeah. Um, and so sort of as we were starting to go through that literature, we started to realize that, like, we actually weren't talking about the same thing. So, like, people were saying regional councils, or they were saying uh, regional planning organizations, or just regional organizations, um, regional governance organizations. They were using all these words. Um, 
to, to level these critiques, but they weren't defining them rigorously, and they weren't um, being consistent in the definitions that they actually did select uh, when they did use them. Um, so that sort of made us back up a little bit to be like, yeah, you know, maybe, so maybe we don't have a good sense of what these things actually are, and we should probably do that before we tear them a new one. Um, so our argument essentially is that we needed some more conceptual clarity about what these regional governance organizations are. Like we just really hadn't come to know. Um, one of the reasons I'm in like this doesn't probably it's probably not going to make sense to you, but um, is they go by like a billion different names. And so uh, development districts, planning commissions, regional planning commissions, all these things have been like kind of lumped together. Sometimes people are talking about planning commissions. Sometimes they're talking about regional. Um, uh, they're talking about development councils. Sometimes they're talking about associations of governments. Sometimes they squish them all together and are talking about everything. But there was again, there was no consistency. Um, the term regional councils has sort of emerged as something uh, that you'll find in the literature, but again, that definition varies by author uh, to the extent that they even have one. Um, and uh, it's just so it's not clearly defined. And then another thing that we found is that this, this notion that regional governance is not effective, it doesn't really exist, it's not important, um, was based on case studies, which is fine, we have nothing against case studies, but they're like pretty you know, sparse, and then also really old research. Like some of the studies that people are citing are like 1976, 1989, you know, you're, you're like, okay, well, maybe, you know, maybe we need, to, we need to update this. So we are arguing that it's time for a clear, rigorous methodology for defining what these things are. We want an, up, an updated empirical research. And then I think we can start being critical about these things. So that's, that's what we did. Ta-da, buy this book. <laughs> Very affordable. <laughs> in in uh, soft cover and everything. Um, we, uh, we being myself and David Miller, and then we had some collaborators on the book, uh, George Doherty and our, our PhD student, PhD student Jay Rickaba at the time, um, came up with the term regional intergovernmental organization, or REGOs, REGOs. Um, and we decided that we would start from a definition of what we were looking for and then go find them and learn about them. So I'm going to open the kimono just a tiny bit here. This is, this is our rigorous methodology. <laughs> just let me just a te give you a peek about how research happens. Um, these are, uh, we're happy with these categories. This is still sort of a work in progress. Um, we use these categories to uh, enumerate Rigo's across the United States. Now that we've done it, uh, we, like when we did that data work, it was like two years ago, two and a half years ago now. Um, we're kind of like <laughs> coming back to it and being like sober after all the fun, <laughs> looking at some cases and being like, is that, how does it fit? Um, so, you know, this is, this is scholarship, right? Like it, it isn't like we got it and we nailed it on the first try and we figured it out. But like these, these basic principles are, are going to stick around. And so the, how do we determine what a rego is? Well, first we looked at all sorts of things that we thought might be regos, and we applied these five criteria. So first, membership. It had to be uh, primarily uh, constituted by general purpose local governments. So it had to be made up of sort of like municipalities, counties, um, that sort of townships, depending on where you are. Um, and that, that made sense. So 51%. Of the, of the membership had to be uh, cities, counties, municipalities, whatever. Um, so that was first, fine. And that gets us away from like things like the RPA and like chambers of commerce and other things that do stuff across regional boundaries but aren't based on local governments. Secondly, the agenda had to be a multi-agenda, uh, multi-policy thing. We were not looking for special purpose districts. We were looking for um, organizations that tried to coordinate policies across multiple multiple issue areas, and so we picked. We have a list of eight. Oh, you'll see that later. Um, and we had the number that you had to have was three in order to count. If you didn't have three, it's not in. Three was the one. Uh, legitimacy. This is an interesting one, and actually one that uh, we're debating a little bit about, like how, where do we draw the line? 
Um, but basically what we wanted to see here was that this, the organizations that we found weren't just like, uh, they had some credibility with other levels of government, essentially. And so we were looking at uh, legitimacy as that state or federal governments had selected those organizations to perform specific uh, delegated policy goals. So you could be an economic development district, an area agency on aging. You could be a metropolitan planning organization. There are a whole bunch of these things um, that, and we're, we're still like tinkering with like, oh, okay, well does this fit, does that fit? But like those three are a really good example of what we're looking for. Um, ambition, this is also a tricky one to measure, but it, the important thing here is that the organization it, in its mission statement and its purpose and its public facing documents is billing itself as a voice of the community rather than a advocate for its members. So, and that, that distinction is very subtle. Like, so one is that we are the voice of a region, right? The second one is we are going to fight for municipalities at other levels of government. That's more of a like lobby organization for municipalities or counties or whatever. Um, where, when you have the ambition to be a regional organization, you are speaking for the region rather than the individual members. And finally, uh, scale. And this was, this is where we cut a lot, right? We decided for a variety of reasons that I can go into later that we wanted one Rego per region. We did not want a lot of these things. And I can go into why. Um, and so we picked the biggest one. Seemed, <laughs> seemed like the way to go. Um, and I can, again, I can get into that in more detail. Um, so you can meet, ta-da, meet the Rigos of America. <laughs> These are, we found 477 regional intergovernmental organizations that fit. Uh, ignore the colors. The colors are population. They're very strange. Um, one thing you might notice is where there is no color. Oh, I wish I had a picture. So interesting. Maybe there's a conspicuous gap. Where we are. <laughs> anyway, you'll notice that there are some white spots. Uh, a lot of that's rural. One of them is New York. 83% <laughs> of the U.S. population is served by at least one Rigo, and I say at least one because there are overlaps in certain places. And almost every state has one of these things. Uh, we have made a database that is available at our website uh, that you can let's see. Ooh. I don't have to zip through the rest. But um, yeah, our database is here. It's open source. We have uh, the geographies of all these things. We have population numbers. We have everything that you could possibly, not everything you could possibly want. Why would I say that? There's <laughs> like a lot of stuff that you, could, you can play with. Um, and uh, that database, we are hoping to update, because as I mentioned, two and a half years has passed. Stuff has changed. We're going to try and sort that out. But uh, it gives you a good idea. You can do lots of fun stuff with it. So there goes of America. And that's uh, now it's time for some descriptive statistics. Are you excited? <laughs> I'm not, you know what, I don't really care about statistics that much. So I'm just going to give you the big picture here. Um, Rigos are in most states. There are a couple of states that don't have Rigos. Uh, they're weird states, right? I can say that, right? <laughs> Delaware. That's kind of a weird state. Uh, Rhode Island, these are really small places where the state government usually takes care of the things that would be regional. Hawaii is one as well. It's sort of got a strange, its own strange thing, and I think it's because it's just far away. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if there are others. I'm trying to remember. Anyway, they're, they're, uh, they're pretty much everywhere. Red states, blue states, purple states. This is not uh, an ideological thing. They're in big states, small states, in urban states, rural states. They are all over the place. Um, also, this is very small, it doesn't really matter. These are a lot of numbers. <laughs> the deal is, is that they're in large regions and they're in small regions. So we have, we have um, regos that are under 250,000 people. We have regions that are extra large, right? We have, we're, over, we're talking about over a million, million people, that doesn't sound extra large from where we're sitting, but from a rego perspective, that's in the rest of the country that it is. You can break it down by like how many of these regos are in whatever part of the country, if, if, should you care to. The big point is that they're all over the place. They're not just metropolitan. They're not just big metropolitan. They are everywhere. This is also probably pretty small. I'll just walk you through it. They're involved in many policy areas. Remember I said that there were eight policy areas that 
we sort of looked at, maybe I said that, I probably did. <laughs> Um, eight policy areas, uh, they are here, economic and work, workforce development, aging senior services, housing, community development, and then sort of a bunch of environmental things here. Transportation, land use, public safety, and constituent services, because a lot of these things are service providers as well in their spare time, actually, many of them are, um, providing some sort of constituent service. Uh, so, as you can see, there, there are not just in transportation. When we first started doing this, I was like, well, all of them are going to do transportation. You think about what, what kinds of stuff you want to govern across jurisdictional boundaries. Well, that's your, that's your rail lines and your bus routes, and like, you want to make sure that your roads connect to one another and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and obviously, this, this sort of makes it look silly because it being broken down into rural and urban transportation, which you obviously stack those together, you end up with a pretty long one. Um, economic development is obviously a big one. Housing and community development was another huge one. This is this is really uh, was an interesting one for us. Um, and then you know that some of these other things are uh, aging and senior services is, is, pro is mostly connected to the area agency on aging mandate that some of these regos have. Um, so anyway, that they do a lot of different things, so many different policy areas, and there's like obviously tons of granularity under all of these. This one's the big like, well, at least for me. Um, Rigo's have been around for a long time. Super duper long time. So you can see that uh, most of the Rigo's had been formed by the end of 1974. Um, that's pretty impressive. Okay, so they've been around for forever. Um, I recently uh, did a cool podcast with some, with some Rigo executive directors. And their uh, Rigos were like on average 50 years old. It is insanity when people, when we're like, wait, what? You've been around all this time and no one's been paying any attention to you at all. Shameful. Let's change that. Spatial relationships. Let's, here, let's see how much time I have. Mm. I'm gonna buzz through this. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting, this is kind of my jam, although I don't know quite what to do with it yet. Uh, here you go. This is a map of the metropolitan statistical areas of the United States. That is the map of Rigos. I'll just leave that there. They're very different. <laughs> They're very different. Um, um, we call that spatial dissimilarity. Um, so what, what ends up happening is that what I had originally thought was like, oh, Rigos are just going to be like basically the metropolitan statistical areas. People are going to like got together and be like, well, if we're an MSA, we might as well just like all play together. Incorrect. Rigos and MSAs have very little to do with one another <laughs> at all. Um, as you can see, this is a little bit hard to see probably, but um, the like funny blobs here are uh, MSAs, and the lines, the dark lines are Rigos. It's Virginia. Um, you can see we've got <sighs> two this one and this one, that are what we call congruent. So the boundaries of the metropolitan statistical area are the same as the boundaries of the region. Everybody else is just doing their own thing. Like, what's going on over here? We're just like, right off the edge of the state. Um, over here is like, yeah, the Rigo, the, oh, this is, well, this is the MSA, sorry. Um, but you can see this, this MSA is broken up to be two different regions. Um, this one was like, you know what, this MSA, Feels good, but we actually want some extra people involved, so they, they just expand it. So this spatial dissimilarity is kind of interesting because it just it gets to the question of when you think about policy space and political space versus the way we think about them statistically. Um, they're very if they're very different things, then we have a bit of an issue because we calculate a lot of things based on MSAs. We do a lot of policy based on MSAs. So like, what if what if that doesn't really mean much? Uh, to the people who are doing the governing in these regions. So that's a puzzle that I'm trying to unpick a little bit. Uh, here are all the different ways that you, you can be different. You can overlap, you can be contained. I'm not going to go through that. It's not really important. But um, we're pointing out that of 477, only 30 are, um, sorry, only 30 of them are congruent, and 18 of those are single county MSAs. So it's, they sort of didn't really have anywhere else to go. Um, it, I mentioned earlier that uh, one of the criticisms leveled against uh, Rigos or their ilk is that um, 
they're heavily dominated by suburban interests and the, the urban interests end up getting subsumed somehow. And that, when, if you think about it, like why on earth would you think that? Um, it, it's based on the idea that this is a one person, one vote structure. Basically every member would get one vote, therefore the city of New York would get one vote, and then all of the suburbs around it would get one vote, therefore that's like a bazillion votes. One, you know, New York never gets its way. Um, and that uh, this sort of underrepresentation of larger city centers would undermine effective regional governance. And it makes sense if you think about it that way, but like, who on earth would join a club like that, right? Why would you do that? That's crazy town. Um, and that's actually sort of one of the reasons why we don't have one of those things here, um, because we're, we're extra sensitive about stuff like that. Um, but as it turns out, uh, nobody's actually really looked deeply into whether that's actually true, like if that's how decisions are made. Uh, so grad student now, uh, fully fledged PhD, uh, challenged this assumption that they're governed by one person, one vote structures, and found that, like some are, but most of them aren't, <laughs> essentially. And this really has important implications for assumptions about how effective these things are, but like also can help us learn a little bit more about collective action. Like you're not gonna join a club if you only get one vote and you're the most powerful one. Um, you're gonna need, you know, so, so this, can, this allows us as actually like a nice little lab to start thinking about theories of collective action. Um, and we're gonna do that. I'm not gonna explain this, he made an index. Essentially the, the deal is, is that he looked at, at the ways you can think about distributing power and influence in decision-making bodies on like two, two axes. One is membership and the other is proportionality. So one is, for instance, you're in New York, okay, you get seven board members and everybody else gets one. Bam. If everyone still gets one, still gets one vote, you've kind of like leveled the scales a little bit. So that's trying to sort things out through a membership profile. Um, another one is distributing votes. One could be like, you, you, have seven vote, you have seven people and each one of you gets two votes. This is starting to get complicated, right? But like this is this is how this is how different you know different structures have evolved in order to balance power a little bit more between multiple competing suburban interests and the more populous kind of centers of gravity within metro regions. And it gets super duper complicated. Like parts of Chicago land have like they you know three jurisdictions split one little vote. They're all like <laughs> sort of like I guess huddle around a table and like have to figure out what they're gonna vote between the three of them. Um, uh, places like uh, Sacramento and Detroit, uh, those regions have dual testing type things. So they have like multiple layers of voting that happens and it's super complicated, your mind would be blown. But like the long story short is that these are not one purpose, one person, one vote structures for the most part, some of them are. Um, they're very sophisticated and a lot of thought has been put into how you balance that power within these organizations. There go, ergo, sorry, I was there for and ergo. There, you know what, I should coin that, there go. Uh, you know, there, you can't just sort of dismiss them at a stroke. Maybe they're ineffective, we don't know. Okay, what's next? <laughs> Wrapping up. Are our egos affected? It, you know, it turns out that after all of that, I haven't answered any questions or really countered effectively some of these critiques that say that these things aren't effective. We don't know, we've just laid the groundwork so that we can start finding out whether they're effective. Our argument is that there are 477 of them. They cannot all be duds. There has to be some that are doing things right. Um, there have to be some that are doing really super interesting things. Um, maybe there's some that are crazy dysfunctional and we do know of some of those. Um, so we need to learn about what's going on with that, what makes them effective, what makes them dysfunctional. Um, why, why, just why. Um, so we have a long road ahead of us in, in doing that, but we think we have a good foundation to start with. Um, are there regos in other places other than America? I mentioned that like, in, when I opened the kimono that we were starting to like think about, mm, like, what are these edge cases? Like, do they fit? Do they not fit? So a lot of that is because we've been talking to people in other countries who are like, well, I have this. Is it a rego? And we're like, mm, well, that's sort of different, so we're grappling with that. Like, are there regos in other places? Is this something we can, that's portable? 
Um, what is the relationship between regos and other types of governance organizations? As I mentioned, right, there we only pick the largest <laughs> of the things that fulfill the first four criteria of our rego, um, our, our rego rubric. And that means that there are a whole bunch of other organizations out there that are like Rego-like, but just not as big. Um, we don't have a, an exhaustive list of those. We know we're missing a bunch, um, but you know, we're in the process of trying to learn a little bit more about those organizations, how they fit, how they interact with these bigger organizations. Um, and also the other thing that we found were regions where there's only an MPO here, for instance. Where there's, uh, you know, where there's only an MPO, why is that happening? Um, is, and so we have, a lot of, we have a lot of questions about that. How and why do Rigos change over time? They've been around for a long time, but they change. Their boundaries change, their rules change, the things that they do change, their governance structures change. So we're interested in that. Um, what's the role of non-governmental and non-traditional actors? As I mentioned, only 51% of the members have to be uh, municipal governments or local authorities in order to qualify as a Rego. That leaves a lot of other things. So what, what else is there? Sometimes there are businesses, sometimes there are chambers of commerce. Um, universities are often represented in some places. Uh, military bases, um, First Nations, um, Native American uh, governing structures are also on there. So we want to learn a little bit more about what the influence is of these types of actors on the decision-making process. Does it make it a little bit easier when there are some like grown-ups in the room that are not fighting squabbling over things? Maybe it doesn't, who knows. Um, what about regions that don't have regos? What happened? Why not? Who knows, we're gonna find out. Um, so we have a lot of plans. We, uh, we as in myself and Dave Miller, we, we are rego maniacs and we <laughs> study regos. <laughs> Uh, these are this is our these are our coordinates. So definitely uh, check out our website, which is a little bit of a hot mess right now, but it will it will get under control. <laughs> um, email me at rigos@pit.edu if you're interested. Um, we're in the process of putting together some NSF uh, research network bids, hopefully to try and build a network of scholars who are interested in this across the country to learn more about rigos, get some like more localized expertise and start building this empirical knowledge. Um, so that's a thing that we're always looking for if people are interested in that sort of thing to come and come on board. We have no money yet. We may have money one day. Uh, we also have done a series of podcasts on Rego. So if this was just wetting your appetite, don't worry. <laughs> There's more. Um, two more podcasts will be posted uh, hopefully by end of day, maybe even later in the week, who knows. Featuring, uh, the first one is me and Dave just rapping about Rigos. The, se the second pair of podcasts, again, as I mentioned, are um, wh where I interview uh, uh, five different executive directors from Rigos around the country. And they had super fascinating things to say about you know, what their organizations do, but most critically, how they see their role. And it sort of like twists your perception of like why these things are important completely around. It's very, very cool. Um, last thing, whew, whoops, I just have to uh, mention, you just have to. I yeah, <laughs> to mention this, uh, Rigos are like one of my, my hustles. I've got another hustle here. It's uh, the LDAP project, which is a study of the L train disruption in New York City. Infrastructure is my jam. Um, and if you're not into Rigos, but you're into trains, call me maybe. I mean, don't call me because it's not on there, but get in touch. The end. I'll go back to this. Thank you. Questions? Critiques? Yes? Hi, thank you very much for your talk. I just had two quick questions for you. Um, one is I'm curious how your group dealt with public authorities, because I would consider something like the Port Authority, uh, the Port Authority in New York, New Jersey, I would consider that to be a regional governmental entity because it, you know, controls the region. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, I'm curious to hear more about the um, the legal authority and the taxing mm. authority that the Rigos you looked at have and how you think that changes their legitimacy or their role, and if it's case-specific or not. Second one's a tough one. The first one's an easy one. 
fails on membership. Right? The Port Authority is a bi-state organization. It doesn't have representation from the city of New York or any municipal um, governments. And so we are focused on organizations that are purely, um, the members are local authorities. So a state can be a member, but it has to be at least 51% local governments, counties, cities, townships, etc. And so Port Authority, no bueno. But uh, we struggled with that too initially, especially since I was sitting in New York and those guys were in Pittsburgh and we did all this research for years and I was just like, whoa. Well, how do we deal with all this? And there are a bunch of things in the New York region actually like that are rego almost, but they fail on various things. So that's, that's the answer to that one. Um, second one is taxing authority, legal authority, right? Um, the really short answer is that we didn't initially look at that. So that wasn't something that was in our first sweep of data. And that now that we're starting to refine what kind of data we're collecting, we're kind of in a like, hmm, <laughs> how, do, how do we, like, what, how, what do we do with this? Right, because some do because they are service providers collect user fees or they, very few of them tax. Like taxing is not a thing that these things do usually. Um, but like there are a couple of edge cases where we're like, does that make them a government? Does that now make them not a rego where it's a voluntary association of governments and this is more of a like <laughs> real deal gover government? Um, and, the, and I'll tell you the interesting case where this came up was, um, uh, I'm Canadian so I've like initially, I've al I always sort of like think about this through a Canadian lens as well. The Greater Vancouver Regional District, which is now called Metro Vancouver, is something that we were looking at as like, is this a rego? And in fact, Dave and I are still trying to figure it out. Like he's like, yes, this is a rego, and I'm like, no, it's a government. <laughs> rego government. So this is again opening the model really wide here. Uh, you know, we, it's not always easy to figure these things out, and we're in the process of hammering it out and trying to figure out what that means. Um, first pass, it didn't really matter. Second pass, it's going to matter um, as we like hone this. Out. Can you, in, in that same spirit, back to those five, your initial criteria for establishing? Yeah. What were your, why did you make some of those decisions? Like, what, why, why classify windows this way? I guess I'm kind of asking if you were looking ahead toward, I mean, I know you're just trying to sort of establish terms, but, you know, why did you decide, for example, not to uh, set things up such that you could look at things uh, with the state membership. What was important about the local? And I'm sure there were yeah. things like that in a few of the cases, and maybe there's a way to generalize sort of like there what is, you were aiming at. There is quite a work. long chapter about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll go into it uh, just briefly. One of the things, because we had to start from somewhere. Um, the, again, the short answer is like when you're doing research, you kind of like go with what you know. I've always studied inter-jurisdictional inter cooperation, so I was only really interested in things that were local governments. Dave was a little bit more flexible, and he, he's a public, uh, public admin guy. Um, so he was coming from the ACIR um, reports, American Commission on Intergovernmental Relations, did a series of reports starting in like the late 50s about this exact problem. Uh, how do you coordinate across jurisdictional boundaries? And they came up with a term called voluntary metropolitan councils, which was one of the things that they'd kind of held up as like, if we could do this, this would be amazing. Um, and you know, looking back at that from today, we're sort of like, wow, that's what everyone wants regional governance to look like in the United States. Like, how close did we get to that, essentially? And so we used that their criteria a little bit as a model. Um, and so their their focus was um, that's where we got the, the we got we justified that based on this sort of framework that they established. Um, they were looking at local governments, local authorities. They're also where we got the scale thing. They thought there was only one of these things per region. Otherwise, you were doing it wrong. <laughs> so that's one way we used to ju justify the scale one as well. Um, legitimacy was, uh, was a way to separate the, the like, organizations with, 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 with this credibility. Like, they're not just... You know, little clubs of, of people with similar interests, like in order to be the designated organization for uh, or deliverer of some sort of policy agenda, you had to be seen as kind of inclusive and like the right size and scale. And so this was sort of a proxy for us of like, just like a test, 
the sniff test of like whether you know whether that was right and, it's, and we thought a lot more things would be cut based on that um, yeah so I you know I could go through all of them but they're like they all had roots in various literatures and various but it was a little bit more it was somehow uh, it sounds like at least based especially on that one criteria from which you wrote mm -hmm. from which you drew as a base uh, the ACIR report yeah crafted around something that everybody said didn't work but you thought kind of might and could, but and that's one, one way of doing it, as opposed to, mm -hmm. I don't know, we're sort of New York centric, but yeah. like, as opposed to saying, what we know there are a ton of out here are these types of things that might look, that might be bigger, or that might have different, less legitimacy, but more, I don't know, prevalence or something, you know, yeah. so it seems like it was channeled toward, well, we think this is here and it probably works better if it is there, that people are saying, as opposed to this is what there is. And here's how it well, okay, so it, like it, again, scholarship is messy, right? Like yeah. you never come at it from one perspective, sure. right? Like we've been in the world a long time um, researching regional governance and like here and there, right? So we knew they existed. So it wasn't like we, but we didn't think that there were that many of them, right? We thought, you know, this was just going to be a metropolitan phenomenon. We thought it was just going to be, you know, may, like maybe we would be lucky if we found a hundred, you know, in the largest metro regions in the country. When we use this Christ, so we started with uh, this is going to be local authorities working together across jurisdictional boundaries for collective aims, like not a top-down state thing. This is what what like the just sort of our vision of regional governance was based on on like lots of theoretical literature and lots of, of sort of this public and men stuff. Um, and then we went, so we sort of constructed this, knowing that we would find some. Um, and we're astonished at how many we found. So I think that that, you know, if, if we went looking for port authorities, we would have a much smaller list. And that's like a different animal. Fun fact, I'm writing a book about the port authority as well, so I can <laughs> talk to you about that at length. Um, totally different animal though, that, that kind of organization. Yeah. I'm just going off of that. I'm kind of curious about the, the organizations that Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious if there's an argument for, for why uh, they're not, their role in like, regional policy coordination is not as efficient or as mm. kind of, kind of strong as the other. And also, um, if there's like, an incentive for them to change their structural family structure in some ways to, to become a regional. Become <laughs> like <a leader. laughs> yeah, um, first answer is okay. Um, I want to like push back a little bit on one of the things you said. The fact that, that an organization doesn't fulfill those five criteria and isn't a RIGO doesn't mean it's not significant. In fact, so one of the things, the arguments that we make is like, yes, we named this biggest one a RIGO. That doesn't mean it's the most effective. It doesn't mean it's the most significant. It doesn't mean that anyone cares about it. The smaller organization may in fact be more important. But that's but we had to we had to draw a line somewhere. We had to like apply it evenly and rigorously across the country, and that was the hill we chose to die on. Um, and a next step is going to be to try and figure out what the relationship is between those regos and what we just call intergovernmental organizations. But I think we're going to have to rename because they're that's confusing and whatever. Um, and so lots to learn there. Um, places where this happens a lot in Pennsylvania. There's just like a bazillion intergovernmental organizations there and a small handful of regos. Uh, but those IGOs are probably pretty important. So again, you know, we needed, we need, our goal was to establish like a conceptual lingua franca here, something that we could start doing research with uh, in as, you know, as comparative a way as we could, um, comparable a way as we could. And, and it's not perfect, but it's, you know, uh, we hope that people will take this, critique it, learn, refine it, do better, and, and, and like move this agenda forward because I think that the issue is we don't want people to stop thinking about regionalism. We want to learn more about it. And by, by yanking these organizations out of the darkness, <laughs> we can hopefully get more people interested. Your second question was, oh, uh, remind me. Is there like an incentive? Incentive. Well, I mean, I guess it's Well, yeah, no, the, so Rigos, remember, well, that's just like a word we made up. Yeah. 
it's like it's a conceptual bucket that that like some some organizations are psyched to be in. Honestly, like we've been going to a lot of the National Association of Regional Councils, the National Association of Development Organizations. There's like the Southwestern Economic Development Districts Association. Um, there, are lots of these practitioners are psyched that someone's talking about them. Um, I haven't met anyone yet who is like, I'm not, we're not a Rego, but we'd love to be a Rego. What do we have to do? Because <laughs> they don't really get you anything. You just get on this list and we'll study you. But um, we're hoping, though, like long term, that this starts to gain some traction in policy circles. In which case, being thought of as a Rego might have some some, some policy advantages. Um, but more than anything, I think we're we're not thinking like oh we're, we, people are going to make policies for Rigos, but that that state and federal governments are going to start to recognize that governing regions is a serious thing, and that there are organizations there with capacity. And maybe if you supported them more, that you could, you know, you want a smaller government? All right, fine. Like there are people who are doing this already in a lot of different places with not very many resources. You could give them more resources and see what happens. And like as we start to unpack how effective they are, what do they do? Like what are they good at? We'll be able to make that case a little bit more effectively. And in which case, I think the people will be like, hmm, hmm, maybe being a Rigo is not so bad. But who knows? You just threw me off a little bit. Are you, do you not like the federalist system? Like, do you just think, do you, <laughs> no. do you think that it's inefficient? Is that what you're getting at? That, that no. So then you're adding a level of government on top of county? It exists. I mean, it's not government. It's, it's a, a, these are 477 governance organizations that exist, that are doing policy, that are coordinating policies across jurisdictional boundaries. Some of them are providing services at a regional scale. Some of them are even getting federal money. Like, this is not a new thing. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying that, like, when, when we're talking about austerity and efficiency and things like that in, in this current climate that's generally anti-urban in a lot of ways, that one of the ways to, to, one of the things that we can do is to think about supporting these governance organizations in various ways. I mean, they're already getting transportation money, they're already getting um, social development money, they're already getting housing money, they're getting all sorts of stuff, um, but just nobody knows about it. Um, they're not governments. All of this is, is based on consensus or whatever their voting structure is. And, and all the members have to play ball in order to make anything happen at a regional scale. But they exist and they're doing stuff. So they are viable policy instruments, perhaps. Thank you. Um, mine was sufficiently blown. Nice. Yeah. Because four hundred and seventy seven blanketing most of the country with the um, governance structure that we never talk about. Never. Is um, shocking, let alone the multiplicity of, um, of, of agenda areas that they're engaged in. Right? Um, I want to talk at length about the spatial dissimilarity right. findings, um, but I'm not going to because we can't be here forever. I will say modifiable aerial unit problem in this room, quickly. Um, and then I'm going to piggyback on all these other comments about the criteria. Yes. Because that's definitely striking a chord in this room. But Certainly. I think I think it's because this is not a question. This is a comment. This is a statement. This is a statement. This is, this is, a, this is a moment. That it's I mean, okay, we're friends. No, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, it's a moment of gratitude. I'm going to thank you for this comment. I mean, on, on one hand, I think the, I mean, giving some conceptual clarity and definitional clarity to this question is what allows us to, is the step that allows us to see how prevalent these structures are, right? Um, but I also find it ex extremely useful, especially in a forum like LIPS, where predominantly the students in the room, to, um, to see the kind of uh, research advantage of that kind of clarity. 
like that you, you draw the line, you have to define it somewhere, but that also allows for what, what could, could be literally a generation's worth of research to follow to answer these efficacy and efficiency and effectiveness questions. Like what happens if you compare the Rigos to all of them, all of them that meet criteria one through four but not five? All of them meet criteria one through three and five, but not four. <laughs> and like now there's a framework for comparison that we didn't have before, let alone a framework, like let alone a definition, mm -hmm. right? Well, beyond a definition. And I think that's super valuable for our students to see, especially as many of them think through how to structure research. Yeah. Um, super fun to time. do this, by like, the way. Yeah. Lots that's, of people are pissed at us. So thank you. <laughs> no, that depends quite a bit of what we know about. Yeah. Regional, just the research on regional governance, yeah. right? Because now you have to call into question the like the need, like the efficacy or the appropriateness and applicability of the MSA as a statistical area. Because if the one thing purpose it's meant to serve is collect statistics, and it doesn't apply. Great. <laughs> but speaking of which, we we have you we now have a tool on the website too that you, allows you to compile any statistic that you can get for the MSA at the Rego scale. So you can compare them, you can like mess around with them. Uh, so much left to be done. Oh my goodness gracious, how much fun is that? It's super fun. <laughs> it's super fun and like there's just a lot to be done. And, and again, like I, I want to like say this again and this is useful for students. We do this with humility, right? With like a humbleness where we knew that there was something out there that to study. We thought that it was important. We built this framework. Is it the only way to think about it? No. And people are pushing back, and that's great. Like, they should. That's what scholarship is. That's what we do, right? And you don't go, like, throw a hand grenade into a whole, like, you know, 100 years of discipline and, like, expect that you're just going to be able to do it. See? <laughs> uh, we're right, obviously, and all of you are wrong. That's not true. And that's sort of one of the reasons why, I like, especially in a group of students, I want to be straightforward about how this is a work in progress, right? Like, we... Had, we, we drew our lines, then every once in a while you get a case and you're just like, oh, what, do we do? what do we do with that? Like, that's life, that's, that's what we do, that's what research is about, and you have to live and die by those decisions, and you can change your mind, right? You can, you can evolve, and we're hoping that enough people engage with this will help it evolve, and help us learn a lot more about these things that are out there doing really cool things really super quietly that allow us to think better about space, geography, planning, about um, big theories like collective action, how people work together. All of that stuff we can get, get at through these things that we couldn't do before. So that's what I want. Be inspired. Learn about regions. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. I believe that you were mentioning that um, having just one vote by municipality was maybe an issue for uh, larger cities. Mm -hmm. um, but I would question if it's more about the type of project than about the size of the um, city or the municipality. Like for example, you have the air train that doesn't affect the suburbs, it doesn't affect Westchester, Western County, Putnam County, whatever. However, the Clapancy Bridge. Uh, affected totally uh, those areas and almost none, almost none in New York City. Yeah. Um, and it would also, of course, the impact was more towards the small towns, uh, both sides of the, of the bridge. So I think that for projects, it's more towards what the areas are impacted than more towards the city of road. Very interesting point. Um, the, the way I would say that we like think about this is that it doesn't really matter whatever their voting structure is, is the voting structure for every single decision they take, whether it affects everybody or it just affects a tiny bit of the region. And so we have to understand that as like structuring power relations more broadly. But you're absolutely right that um, depending on, and like it's not just project, it's policy area. So you can think of like, all right, an environmental kind of concern might have a different set of interests that align than a uh, transportation concern, like where do you build a road or where do you build a bridge or like the kinds of things you want to do. They're not unrelated to one another or same thing with housing, but like different types of, of interests and uh, motivations come into play in those. And so what we're super interested in is like, is it easier to do collective policy in transportation 
or housing or these other things? What are the types of areas that we're finding like really successful cooperation versus much more contentious types of relationships? Are there things that these organizations won't touch because they're like hot? You don't want to. You don't still want to like open that can of worms, right? Um, so that's an excellent point, and I could go on at length about how the L train is going to affect the suburbs, but. New Jersey. <laughs> um, but you know, but that but I take your point, right? Which is that there are things that are hyper localized, and there are things that are much more regional, and there are things that affect just one part of a region versus the whole thing. Um, and those are all things that we need to learn more about how these regions balance that and and get along. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't, and we don't know. We have no idea. Not yet. <laughs> Working on it. Thank you so much. Thank you.